I was actually going through a lot of your lectures. I, I particularly liked the title. It was a lecture conducted at your clinic, which was the evolution of the horse's mouth bit fitting. What the bleep do we know? Yes, <laughs> yeah. We will uh, talk about the three different dimensions I, I think are really important. Yeah. Have a look at the horse, have a look at yeah. what we are doing as veterinarians, but also having a look at the bigger picture. And just the fact that the horse is chewing makes that it's actually kind of a kind of second pump. It's a second circulation. So as long as the horse is capable of relaxing and uh, engaging the masseter muscle, it has the possibility to send away that blood which is accumulating in the horse's head. So you could argue, do, do humans need a dentist? Probably not, because we survived 2.5 million years without a dentist and we're still there. But what's the big difference is that we are now living a much healthier life as what our ancestors did. Uh, we have a life expectation which is triple the one uh, of the cavemen, so to speak. But the horse is chewing 16 to 18 hours a day. Chewing 16 to? 16. I didn't know that. It's 50,000 cycles, on average, 50,000 cycles a day. So I think it's pretty clear I'm going to have to um, up my uh, IQ for this uh, podcast. This episode of TOT the Podcast is brought to you by... Connect. Fully electric tractors. Welcome back, guys, to another episode of TOT the Podcast. Today, my guest, an equine veterinarian, the owner of... Equida Veterinarian Practice in Belgium, a practice that is fully dedicated to as all aspects of modern equine dentistry. The man sitting across from me did his Bachelor of Science at the University of Antwerp, graduating with distinctions, moves on, of course, to the Masters in Veterinary Science, also at University, or oh, then at University of Ghent, graduated with high honors. With a major in equine research, his thesis being the study of invasion mechanisms of the equine herpes virus. Super interesting. Then further his research in educating himself in laboratory animal sciences, also at the University of Kent, also graduating with high distinctions. And the list goes on with further training and education of himself so much so that I had to uh, reload my printer three times <laughs> to print out <laughs> the long list. Um, and his professional recognition list is just as long, awarded the best thesis in research for his academic year. Also a board member of the Nordic College of Equine Dentistry, NCED. So you may be thinking now at this point, oh, Great, a nice intellectual theory man, but no. In his practice, this man treats more than 2,000 patients a year, including all forms of dental care and surgeries. So I think it's pretty clear I'm going to have to um, up my uh, IQ for this uh, podcast. Well, to Jamie, you'll, you'll welcome, welcome to the podcast. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. I'm looking forward to this podcast. So. My pleasure. Let's start. And I also read in uh, the lengthy bio, you also speak five languages. Yeah, not fluently all five of them, but uh, yeah. yeah. We... I struggle with the fluency of English. So yeah. if, we, <laughs> if we keep <laughs> me, that above me board. Too. Yeah, let's try just to do it in English and um, yeah. <laughs> and we'll, and we'll that everybody it. can follow. Yeah, let's hope. <laughs> let's hope. Good stuff. I also liked, I was actually going through a lot of your lectures. I, I particularly liked the title. It popped up a few times. Uh, it was a lecture conducted at your clinic, which was the evolution of the horse's mouth bit fitting. What the bleep do we know? Yes. Is yeah. <laughs> For a long time, that was the the title. I, I now changed it a little bit. Um, so now I, now it's called uh, evolution in three dimensions. So okay. I, I think we will we will probably... Uh, talk about the three different dimensions I, I think are really important. So uh, yeah, yeah. have a look at the horse, have a look at yeah. what we are doing as veterinarians, you know, like the um, treatment part, um, but also having a look at the bigger picture and uh, where, where the intersection is in between uh, the health of the horse and training a horse. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
what are the major things we as a writer should take care of and what are the the, the keys we can we can give actually or the yeah so before i have keys. to put my glasses on <clears throat> to to make uh, up for the iq difference here let's just start with a brief talk on equine industry what is it mm -hmm. where is it coming from where is it going yes and just to give an overall view of sort of the evolution of yeah. equine industry yeah uh, that's a good start i think and if you allow me, I will just broaden that even to dentistry in general, um, because on the way here, I had some 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 thinking or time to think. And uh, if you look at uh, human uh, evolution, we're talking about two and a half million years, more or less, when we started to escape our cave and become what we are right now. Uh, and then if you look at dentistry, because if I would ask the question to you, is it important as a human to go to the dentist or to send your kids? in time to the dentist, then probably 95% of us would say, yes, of course. But it's not such an easy question, actually. And if you look a little bit further, it's only probably around 100 years that we're really doing dentistry in humans. Before that, we took care of some dental pathologies just by doing amputations. You had some witch or whoever who came to you uh, when you were in serious pain and they would just take out a broken tooth or try to heal uh, uh, tooth abscess. So even in humans, it's pretty recent. Uh, so you could argue, do, do humans need a dentist? Probably not, because we survived 2.5 million years without a dentist, and we're still there. But what's the big difference is that we are now living a much healthier life as what our ancestors did. Uh, we have a life expectation, which is triple the one uh, of the cavemen, so to speak. Uh, we don't allow ourselves to suffer for days, weeks, months of dental pathology. Um, so, so those are all major things. And then, then we come to veterinary medicine, because you could say, do animals need a dentist? And that's a good question as well. Um, let's start with cats and dogs, for example. Do they need a dentist? Maybe not. But if tonight you're going to watch some television and you're sitting in your couch and next to you is a dog with an awful bad uh, smell out of his mouth, then probably that's already a clue that your, your dog needs to go to the dentist. So when you, when you look at that, I think most cat and dog owners, they would realize at some point they need to have their teeth checked. And that's typically done when they go to the yearly uh, checkup, when they have their vaccinations. Yeah. So there's no one questioning, where do I need to go with my dog if it's having dental problems? You would go to the, to the, the vet. Um, looking at some other species, um, we could say, why are cows not going to the dentist and sheep and, um, and, and pigs, for example? Well, it's a very easy answer, actually, because they almost never get to the age where they might develop some dental problems. Yeah. Um, so it's logic that cows don't go to the dentist because the average cow will be on your plate uh, when it reaches maybe two, three, four years of age. Yeah. Looking at, at swine, it's even a pig only lasts for a few months. So, so these animals, they don't need it because they don't have the same uh, life expectancy. Yeah. Um, although a cow can reach the age of 20 years. And then coming to horses, it's very, very special, of course. Everything with horses is special. Um, we do dentistry on horses for quite a long time. Um, so as soon as domestication started, uh, there is some evidence that people at least had a look in the oral cavity of the horse. It was really important to know because the age of the horse is really important when it comes to the value. It still is, but it always has been. Uh, so people paid attention to the teeth of the yeah. horse. Um, and another really important thing is that horses, they rely on their teeth much more than we or than cats and dogs. I often explain my clients, if, for example, you would lose your teeth, all of your teeth tonight, what's the problem? Uh, you will have a harder time finding a, a girlfriend, that's for sure, because you will be much more ugly. You might have some, some problems in your pronunciation. But when it comes to eating, you will find things you can eat. It's yeah. not such a big deal. And if it takes three times as long because you need to have some soup and some coffee to weaken your breath or whatever, it's even that's not a problem because yeah. you are chewing 20 minutes a day or 40 yeah. minutes a day. If it goes times three, you still have plenty of time to ride horses or do whatever you want. Yeah. But the horse is chewing 16 to 18 hours a day. So if they have some dental problems and they, they take 50% more time or 100% more time, they're in a shortage of, yeah. of time and they're actually uh, going to starvation really fast. 
chewing 16 to 16 i didn't know that it's fifty thousand yeah. cycles on average fifty thousand cycles a day they are doing so it's it's impressive and we'll come back to that because i think it's a really really interesting thing when we talk about training courses and yeah. what happens but i think that that's better to, to take a little bit later on yeah. uh, so if you allow me because i'm talking a lot now but evolution is is going rather fast so we have had in human dentistry there was this witch pulling out uh diseased teeth like 200 years ago nowadays it's a specialty you go to a, a qualified dentist uh, they all all have their own specialism uh, so we came to the point that we do minimal invasive things we're working on prevention um, and that kind of moves on to the the animals as well so even in horses uh, it's it's much more than only floating teeth. It's much more than only extracting teeth. We consider a tooth extraction as being a failure because yeah. it means that we could not save that tooth. Yeah. So we're, we're working a lot on um, the health of the surrounding tissues, so the, the health of the gums. Uh, we're treating teeth in an early stage of disease, which means restorations, uh, endodontics, so root canal treatments. Um, and of course, when a tooth has to come out, we have different techniques to do that in a minimal invasive way. Um, so we're not there yet that it's the same level as in human dentistry. It's also much more complicated in horses, but the last 20 years, it's a massive evolution. Yeah. Um, so you're not going to see um, braces or uh, we <clears throat> plates. So <laughs> we do some braces mm -hmm. for sure in young horses with fractures, um, but and then, there we come back to this point of uh, 16 hours chewing a day. Yeah. We actually don't need the braces because if we can change a little bit the, the angles, the occlusal angles of the mm -hmm. teeth, uh, combine that with 16 hours of pressure on that tooth, we actually can move that tooth without the yeah. need of braces. Yeah. Yeah. Because braces in humans, it's the only purpose is to create pressure on that tooth, a small amount of pressure for a long period of time. Yeah. And that we can do by changing the angles it's yeah. what we call odontoplasty so we change the, the the levels and which means that we can actually move a tooth few millimeters to the left to the right uh, and that's really interesting yeah. because yeah. in this we can actually keep the the, yeah. the mouth in a good condition wow i was i knew i was looking forward to this conversation while okay. that we've been <laughs> planning for a while but yeah now i'm looking forward to it even more okay well, brilliant. That, that was just the introductory question by the way guys just in so keep up. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, is everyone aware of of the importance of equine dentistry? Because of course, I've just recently, the last couple of years, closed my training stable. But even two, three years ago, I was having horses sent with undesired behaviors and they were five, six years old and they'd never seen yeah. a dentist. Yeah. So of course, in, a, in an ideal situation, there is regular treatments but across the board has that come a long way in the past or is uh, there still a huge gap of, of there's still a huge gap i think the awareness is is increasing we're still struggling a little bit with training the vets around to have a, a decent level as well so some of the horses are never checked some of the horses are checked but probably not in the optimal way uh, so there's still a lot of education needed uh, that's also one of the reasons to do this podcast it's not it's not a, a commercial uh, interest it's just training of people because in the end it's an animal welfare issue yeah because and there we, we we go back we constantly go back to earlier times actually but if you look at where horses are coming from and i think it's important in training as well these are animals who have um, a huge benefit in hiding their problems because if they show weakness that's when the lion will attack them the lion is not attacking every single horse uh, the lion is not a, a uttermost lazy animal. He's often doing nothing, but what he's doing at that moment is actually observing the herd to spot the zebra, which is lame, which is having dental problems, which is ill anyway. And mm -hmm. then they will try to chase that one. So if you look from that perspective, a horse will never ever uh, clearly show its problems. It might show them in a very subtle way, to the other animals within that same herd so at least they are aware there's something going on and it's a quite um, black and white story because the herd at some point will decide if it's minor issues we will protect you if it's major issues maybe we're just gonna give up on you 
and let that lion chase you so the rest of the herd is safe. Eat you instead of the yeah. possibility of yeah. eating us. Yeah. yeah, so it is, it is quite hard. <clears throat> so, so think about this. If you wait until horses are showing big problems, of course, if you are aware of very subtle uh, clinical signs, then you will spot them. But the big things, they will only show in a very, very late stage. Yeah. Uh, and that's why it is so important to be in time and to work on prevention. Because if you wait until the tooth is completely mobile and, uh, and, and developed a, a tooth abscess, then of course, there is no, no sense in trying to, to save that tooth. Then it's an extraction. And then um, as well, as I already said, if they, if they have bad teeth, they, they won't live as long as one with healthy teeth. And it's going to cost you a lot of money for dental checkups, but also the feeding regime of a horse with, uh, with diseased teeth. It's, uh, it's incredible how much money it costs. Yeah, yeah. So prevention is key, of yeah. course. Yeah. yeah, and of course, the earlier, that's, <clears throat> we often hear a trying, or I've, I've for a long time, because of horses coming with issues that they develop uh, through being started and maybe having problems, having to go through a bidding, riding process, starting on the saddle with wolf teeth or whatever it is, and seeing the issues they then carry, not only in the teeth, but the rest of the body, which we'll get into later. Um, but I always try to do that now that I, before in the starting on the saddle process, before I put the bit in, I have the che teeth checked. checked. But should I be saying mouth instead yeah. of because? Yeah, absolutely. It's the whole anatomy of the horse's mouth and head, actually, yeah. that's important. Yeah, exactly. If I Because I think we, we should look much wider than only the, the teeth. Mm -hmm. It's also about the the gums. It's also about all the mucosa or the soft tissues which are there. Um, in a young horse, for example, just it's always a little bit trial and error, but at least you can make a, um, a very good guess. If you have a thorough look in the oral cavity, you will see, okay, this is one with a, 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 a smaller tongue or a bigger tongue. This is one with rather fleshy mouth corners or not. What's the size of bit you should use? It's it's very strange that people tend to use always the same size. Although when you go to a, a shoe uh, shop, you buy yourself some new shoes. The first thing you would do is have a look at the the size, um, and then have a look at which ones of those with the correct size uh, you like. Uh, and in horses, in when it comes to to snaffles, for example, most people they just take. A random size and that uh, they just start but i think it's a mistake yeah um and there's a lot of things that can can be wrong you know it's um not in the young horses now but for example in the older horses we quite often um advise people to do some blood sampling for ppid so the uh, former cushing's disease yeah and and that decision is is solely made by the aspect of the of the the, um, the soft tissues and the, it just doesn't look healthy so it's, there's more than only the teeth, actually. Yeah. Um, absolutely. And in my sort of limited, which is, again, when I was preparing for this and trying to get onto a level where I sounded, mm -hmm. that was the thing in the beginning. I thought I have actually limited info. I've been in horses all my life, and I'm yep. meant to be the person that's teaching learning theory and helping and having the answers for people's horses. And <clears throat> actually, the, you know, and then when I was looking through after I sort of made that point, um, you know, then I was thinking, so what are the important things? So the list I sort of made was sort of the overall anatomy. So mm -hmm. what is it that is making up the anatomy? What is the function of, say, there's probably a list of other things that you can list, but yeah. I, what is the function of the bars? Yeah. Because that's what we hear about. Yeah. And then um, through little experience with, other types of therapists talking about TMJ, talking mm -hmm. about blood flow in the yep. horse's head. Um, and of course the big thing with, from a rider's perspective, and probably I've just made a whole list when each of them we can talk about for an hour, yep. but saliva as, as a, as yep. an, an atomic, because when we talk one. about riding, yep. do they over saliva? Is that stress? Do they not? Yep. So they're not accepting the bit, you know, especially in dressers, we're looking at yep. all kinds of things, but, you know, so if you can talk a little bit about like the overall anatomy, function of the bars, blood flow to the head, okay, they're big things. Yeah. But for me, yeah, it gives me and hopefully the people listening a better idea of sort of real horse head anatomy. Yeah, yeah. I think it's really interesting. So it, it doesn't have to do a lot with dentistry now. So if you're here for 
very advanced theories about dental diseases in horses, then then I suggest we, we have another it's in the episode too. It's in episode but two. now we'll focus on on more like physiology. Because uh, when we go to vet school, we get this, you know, embryology, anatomy, physiology, but the weak point is always get putting everything together. So I'll I'll try to keep it brief, but think again about what I said. They are chewing 16 to 18 okay. hours a day. What are they normally doing? They are meant to be out in the field. They have their head in a position to the ground. Uh, they are cutting the grass with their incisors, um, organizing that, and then with their cheek teeth, grinding that down to very short fibers. It's massively difficult to chew grass and to digest it. That's why we can't do it. That's why horses develop the teeth as they are having. Um, what is really important, I think, and now we come to the, to the blood flow, so imagine that we are doing the same thing. So we are going to go out in the field now and we will put our head down and try to eat or cut the grass with our incisors. The first thing which is going to happen is that blood will accumulate in our head because if our head is in a lower position than our heart, we will get a swollen red head. And that happens really fast. If you put yourself just upside down, it takes 30 seconds. It becomes a little bit uncomfortable. After two or three minutes, you're in a very bad state and you just want to put yourself up again. again. Um, yeah. So there's no difference in between horses and humans. So if they, if they didn't make um, another system, they would exactly have the same thing. So if they put their head lower than their heart, blood will just accumulate there. And I see that every single day because we do tranquilize horses for the treatments. And afterwards, um, they're often still a little bit dizzy and the head is in a low position. And I do see the head's going big and you see above their eyes there is it's just popping out yeah, yeah so there is accumulation of blood but you don't see that when horses are out in the field how comes it's because there are anatomical changes so if you look at uh, a horse um a horse's head they have massive masseter muscles because they need to chew for 16 18 hours a day um, and below that muscle so in between that muscle and the bone of, of its skull there are some blood vessels, very wide blood vessels. So they actually accumulate the blood over there. And just the fact that the horse is chewing makes that it's actually kind of a kind of second pump. And it will pump away the blood which accumulates in the head. It's like a second circulation. Yeah, it's a second circulation. <clears throat> so as long as the horse is capable of relaxing and uh, engaging the masseter muscle, it has the possibility to send away that blood which is accumulating in the horse's head. And now it becomes really interesting because if you're riding a horse, depends on what, what type of riding you're doing. Mm. And I don't want to offend anyone, but we will probably focus a little bit on the dressage because there you, you focus on a steady position of the head, more or less at the level of the heart or a little bit below. Uh, so you risk of accumulating blood over there. So what is important is actually that that horse at least is capable of chewing you know like relaxing and engaging the masseter muscle and when is it possible in, in doing that it depends first of all on the mental state because if it's completely stressed really stressed it's going to have a tense muscle anyway yeah but if it is you know like what i would say positively stressed because it's a big competition you know it's a bit stressed but it's not massively it will relax now and then in training it should relax a lot mm -hmm. Um, also in the warming up, it should be able to relax so that it can actually get rid of that blood. And I would just invite you, have a look at the next competition, have a look at those horses' heads and you will see differences. Some of them have a normal head and some of them have a very, uh, like swollen head with all the blood vessels clearly running on top of their, of their, um, their head. So it gives you an indication of the, the status of that, uh, animal. And I think it's really, really important. Yeah. Um, Wow, I mean that's a total. I've never heard anybody say it like that. Yeah. I've never had as there's maybe many people listening that yeah. going, "Oh yeah, yeah, that makes sense." But I've yeah, never... it took me a while as well to yeah. to see because the origin of this comes from uh, when I started my career. I was asked by a lot of uh, professional riders just to float their horses' teeth because it, it's all related. Uh, same thing. If I only float those horses, um, their teeth to take away the sharp enamel points, some of them, they became better. And some of them, they had the same problems. They had the same lesions. They constantly had bruises in their cheeks. It's the same story. Because if the muscle, the, this masseter muscle is constantly engaged to the full 
you know, like full extent, tension, contraction, uh, you will always create soft tissue lesions. Yeah. And so the, this, this idea of this bloodstream, it's, it's the same theory we have when we look into the oral cavity, the quality of the, of the soft tissues of the mucosa. If the horse is chronically stressed, you will have lesions um, on, on several aspects. And it's really funny because I asked... That's a bit, no bit, or, or... It doesn't matter. So you even without a bit, you will have cheek lesions. So we, we see it, for example, we see it when horses are stressed. It's not only when they are ridden. For example, you are introducing a new, a new horse in a, in a small herd and he gets some... There's some fighting involved mm -hmm. to, you know, like find the right position. If you check those horses... At such a moment in their life, they probably have more lesions in their mouth. And it's actually exactly the same thing in humans. I wasn't aware of, and I have a good friend of mine as a human dentist, is also a quite good rider, and I invited him to join me one day in a big stable, and I said to him, look at this, all these horses, they have these lesions, and we don't see that in humans. And that was my um, my assumption, ID, yeah. assumption. And then he said, of course we see it in humans. <laughs> and that's where it got interesting. I said, yeah. well, when do you see it? Well, I see it when students in there, uh, when they are studying, you know, when they have to pass their exams, they have this white line. It's called a white line uh, frictional keratosis in their mouth. And I was like, wow, so you see it in humans as well. <laughs> yeah, we see it in people, you know, like uh, pretty diseased people or people yeah. who are going through a divorce. It's just, you can just read it in their in their um, oral mucosa. Mm. Same with horses. Mm. So, so, yes, we do take away sharp enamel points. Sometimes with good reason, just to help the horse through a difficult period of time. Um, because it is stressful to train a three-year-old horse, for example. But on the other hand, it, it needs to be balanced. If we need to do that constantly in a very aggressive way, it means something's wrong. Something's wrong in the training. Yeah. Um, so, so I think that's really, really nice to, to find that correlation. So have a look at your horse. Yeah. And um, of course, it's not a problem. Because then people often think black and white and they say, but then we should abandon the dressage riding and we should not keep that horse's head position stable. Well, the competition lasts how long? You know better than me, but three and a half minutes, yeah, four minutes, minutes, six yeah. minutes. It doesn't really matter if it's only for that short period of time yeah. because the judges want to see it. I don't have such a big problem with that. But think about it. The competition is only one thing, but the training, it's, it's, yeah. it's much more time goes into yeah. training. So do your difficult exercise, takes one minute, and then make sure that the horse can change the position of the head, yeah. can relax one moment so the blood goes away, yeah. so he, he is again fresh to do the next exercise. I think that's really important. Um, I have so many, like, I have to now stay focused because my brain's going with all this training focus on why we do this and why we do that and should we do this and what does that lead to? So we... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> to stop the podcast going for ten hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry if I'm no, talking no, but too much. But, I mean, uh, it's amazing, amazing. It's uh, and and of course, so so then, what is now? I'm going to ask this question because, and it's not part of the plan, but I'm getting my yeah, I have to it's okay, my brain. <laughs> <laughs> so if you so thinking about those things, how is that connection to the saliva then? Yeah, well, it's a it's it's a good question because it's the same thing. Um, of course, those in the podcast, they can't see it. But Tristan has been we, really we can, kind we can show some, to yeah. us. Yeah. And there's a glass of water in front of me. Why is that glass of water there? It's because most people, when they need to present, they might be stressed. And the first thing which happens when you're stressed is you'll have a decrease in your saliva. And the saliva you are producing is actually not sticking very much. Mm -hmm. So you get this very dry mouth. So the both the quantity and the quality of your saliva is changing. Um, now, I'm not very stressed. I am I would say I'm positively stressed about this. And if a horse is in the same extent stressed when he's doing a competition, there's not a big problem because I don't need that water right now. Like a difference um, between excited and... Yeah, it's just yeah. Some, some excitement. <clears throat> but if I was really stressed, and most of the times when I do a lecture, I just... I just tell the audience, you know, I'm going to kill one of you and don't laugh with it because it's, it's, it's real and you can't run away. Uh, and then you, what you will see is, first of all, everyone is going to close his mouth and he's going to engage his masseter muscle. Not only the masseter muscle, all muscles. You'll be, you know, stiff mm -hmm. as hell and you will all have a decrease in your saliva, which is not problematic if after 10 minutes I would just say, 
okay, it's just a joke or I would just kill one and then say, no, now that one is dead, so I'm not going to kill anybody else, then you will relax again. But if it's, a, if it's for a prolonged time, then you will get into problems. And if you have uh, a lack of saliva in your cavity, you get much more friction. It's a huge problem with all the um, plastic uh, bits we are using. I'm not saying they are bad, but if you use them in a too dry oral cavity, they cause much more friction than a metal one. Um, so that's also something we need to try and read. Uh, normal horses in good mental shape, they will have uh, saliva production, which is, you know, like in most cases, you will see it at the, at the, the border of their lips. You will see a little bit of foam. Um, those with a too dry mouth, often it's chronic stress. Um, but sometimes uh, they can go into hypersalivation as well. So the clear signs of hypersalivation where you see the foam coming out everywhere, I would say it's tricky. If it's just happening sometimes, maybe it's okay. Maybe it's just the excitement of the competition. But if that constantly ha happens, I think it's not a very good sign either. Mm -hmm. um, so that's about the saliva. Um, and it... But it would lead us too far. But also that because the, the, the content of the saliva is changing, we also see changes to the teeth, for example. So there is quite some uh, research nowadays. We see a lot of carriers, peripheral carriers in horses. And there seems to be a relation with not only with the nutrition, with the water, but also with um, the stress levels mm -hmm. they are coping with. So more stress means possibly more damage to the tissues due to a decrease of buffer capacity of the saliva. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And then just finally the bars, because the, the function of the bars, yeah. because of course, when I am thinking about dentistry and we're thinking about, you know, maybe not so good training and a lot of pressure, it's always the, yeah. the topic is yeah. about the bars. So yeah. what is the actual anatomic function? Yeah. So there's a good question as well. And we go back again, you know, like millions, millions of years back in time. Horses, they were the size of a big dog, of a deer. So let's say 40, 50 centimeters high. They were living in the forest. I'm just going to do this very briefly. So there was a climate change as we are uh, seeing right now. But there has been a climate change. And uh, instead of forests, the savanna, so the, the open areas with grasses, they were in favor. So these animals, they actually had to come out of the forest, go into these open areas. And because they were much more vulnerable over there, they decided to become bigger. It's just the evolution theory. Mm -hmm. So that's why they grew. That's why they developed a single toe. That's why uh, they developed another type of dentition to cope with this very difficult to eat and to digest uh, grass. Um, and now we come back to the beginning of our story. Imagine that we go out in the field again and we put ourselves or, or our heads towards the grass and we start eating grass. What's the problem? Our eyes and our mouth are very close to each other. So if we are starting to eat grass, we basically are looking to the ground and we have no idea what's happening around us. Grass is in our eyes. The, the grass would be in our eyes. So horses, because they are... 60 to 18 hours a day, they're with their nose and their, their front teeth to the ground. They needed a system in which they could still overview the surroundings because they are um, prey animals. Yeah. Um, and so by increasing the length of their head, having a very long nose, having a very extended head, they increase the distance in between the eyes and the incisors. And so partially the bars have the function just to elongate the head. It's the first thing. Second thing is, if you have, have a close look at the horse, which is grazing, you will see that it's um, cutting grass maybe six times, eight times, ten times. And then it's going to kind of select what it's willing to eat. So what it doesn't want is just going to pop out sideways uh, just because the tongue is very flexible and, and um, movable the over and there in between the insides and at the level of the bars. Yeah. So the innervation is, is at, the, at its highest um, at the tip of the tongue and the um, uh, mucosa at the level of the bars. So that's where they are actually organizing and selecting what they want to eat. It's the filtering system. It's the filtering system. Yeah. And then they actually organize it into a kind of bolus. And then they start the real engine, which is the cheek teeth, and they will start grinding down. As soon as food passes 
the level of the bars, it's hard for a horse to get it out again. Yeah. So you will you sometimes see it, but then it's a struggle for the horse. It's really opening its mouth. It's making these very uh, funny moves with its mandible to try and get that food out. Um, but you should not be scared too much because they have a very good selection system, much better than cows, for example. If you were, were here in a, a farmer's area uh, next to... Uh, fields for cows often people or the farmers would mention please don't throw any metal inside yeah. of the field because a cow is non-selective grazing um, he's just taking it in because his theory is if it doesn't work in one time I'm just going to chew another time because they are uh, I don't know the name in English now but regurgitating yeah. I think it yeah. is uh, horses the two mixed for the digestion yeah uh, horses are not so they yeah. they only have one chance um, so if you if you keep this in mind, this is the the true um, function of the bars. So it's the most sensitive part. Yeah. And we are putting a, a bit a snaffle or whatever at that area. It makes sense because it's very sensitive. So we can actually with minor uh, aids or um, signals we can transfer a, a message. But of course, if you abuse it, it's the most sensitive part of the oral cavity. And the second thing, and that's probably we will discuss this later on when it comes to bitting lesions, the bars, it's actually a very, very strong or hard bone. So the mandible, um, it's one of the hardest bones within the equine skeleton. And on top of that crest-like bone, because it's a very, it's, it's almost like a knife, it's very sharp. Just on top of that, there is only some, um, periost and and some mucosa only two millimeters so it's really yeah, really bone. yeah it's, so yeah. if you damage this area you damage almost inevitably the bone and damage to the bone takes a lot of time to heal so often people would tell me you know but lesions in the oral cavity they heal really fast it's rubbish in my mind that's rubbish it's not because it's in the oral cavity that it heals fast the question is is it a healthy wound? Mm. If you have an acute healthy wound in a very vascularized uh, area, which afterwards you, you give some rest, yes, it's going to heal fast. You can take a scalpel, just make an incision in the tongue, leave that horse alone, just flush them out with some disinfectant, and after one week, it's completely healed. But if you have a, a blunt uh, tool, like a snaffle, which you're going to squeeze on top of the bars, you'll get bone uh, or bone damage, even bone necrosis, and that might take months to heal. Mm -hmm. So maybe just to explain this once more, often when we give these lectures, I would say to my clients, you know, I'm going to kick you on your leg as hard as I can. You cannot run away, but I will give you 10 seconds to think about your position. And if you are smart, you would just turn around and you offer the back of your leg. So I would just give you a huge kick on your muscle. And if you're smart enough, you would make sure that that muscle is relaxed. The moment I'm going to give that kick, it's going to hurt. You will be lame for two days, but you won't die and you won't be suffering massive pain. But if you're not the smartest in the group and you stay just faced to me and I would kick you on. And now you have to help me with the name, but uh, yeah, exactly on that yeah, crest like yeah. stru structure as well on that bone. I might, in, in worst case, fracture your bone. Probably not, but you will have massive pain because I have yeah. direct impact on your bone. Uh, and that's yeah. a huge difference. Yeah. So yeah. keeping that in mind as well, the bars, they are so sensitive. And as soon as you make changes, they're often lifelong. Yeah. So it's important when you buy a horse, for example, you buy a 12-year-old dressage horse, Grand Prix level, I think it's more than, than uh, worth it to have a palpation of the bars to feel yeah. is there any damage or has there been any damage because if there is a lot of scar tissue over there i'm not sure it's going to be the easiest case to keep yeah. in good shape if you are forced to use for example a double rider well because if you think about that as being the filter system i mean it's affecting everything yeah the absolutely nutrition, the yeah. slime the whole the whole yeah. workings of how yeah. the body is going so to we absorb. We see a lot of damage in the oral cavity. Most of that is reversible. Maybe you end up with a small scar or whatever. Um, but I imagine sometimes we need to go do a surgery. We have to go through the cheek, for example. I don't like to do it. But honestly, afterwards, these horses, you can palpate that area 
uh, they don't show any signs of discomfort as, as soon as it's healed. When it's about bar lesions, there is a, a lifelong, I don't know what it is, a sensitivity or these horses, they are just, you know, like it's, it's in their brain. As soon as you hit that spot, the horse is at least, it's very uh, insecure or it becomes very, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not finding the word now, but, um, or they are just <clears throat> showing clear signs of pain. Yeah. You just squeeze that area, just gentle push with your thumb and these horses, they are uh, showing signs of um, of defense or reluctance. Yeah. Uh, I think it's really important. Yeah. yeah, super interesting, super interesting. So when we're thinking about the effects of, um, yeah, like the oral cavity, or if we're talking about, now we're talking about the whole head, but if we're talking just about dentistry, if we have issues uh, in the mouth or poor dental care or too much, mm -hmm. the old the farrier comes in yeah, with the black absolutely. and decker sander and he's shining them down to marbles. Um, how much effect does that have? Do we even know how much effect that can have on the yeah. horses? Bite? Honestly, honestly, we, we don't know how much effect. What we do know is that, um, so very important to mention here again as well is horses, they do have different teeth compared to us, but deep inside is actually the same thing. You have blood vessels, you have nerves, you have, nerves, you have uh, lymph vessels all going in the pulp. So inside, of course, this is sensitive tissue. And now it comes, so we don't know exactly how painful it is. That, that's a, a very big question in horses. How, how much do they experience pain? Because they can cope with a lot more, lot, lot more than what we can. So probably their pain level is different than, than our tolerance is different compared to us. But what we do know is inside it's vital. Inside there is innervation. There is even more innervation than there is in our teeth. And if you then go to true anatomical studies and you, you're just going to look where then do these nerves end? Where is the last vital part we can see? And then you come with very... Uh, crazy results actually it's in some cases it's only 0.2 millimeters below the occlusal surface so it means that as soon as we are starting to grin down some dental tissue we should realize that this might be painful to the horse mm -hmm. um so that's really important um i kind of forgot the question now yeah so it's more if if i'm thinking about just for instance the 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 phrase about the farrier coming in yeah. with the black and decker drill and the sander and sanding it off. Yeah. And going back to what we're talking about, people are thinking just that it's about taking the sharp edges off. Yeah. <clears throat> what sort of, because when you talk about like being able to, the amount of chewing and being able to shift teeth by the pressure, mm -hmm. I can imagine with no care or yeah. with too much love, really yeah. polishing them up. You know what sort of damage yeah absolutely so by changing a lot to the occlusal surfaces so just basically doing aggressive floating you kind of lose all the possibilities to do small changes because if you change everything in the end nothing will really happen to the to the good maybe maybe everything stays stable in best of cases in the worst or case you will see some deterioration of that oral cavity what also happens is that you speed up the wear of their teeth because they don't have teeth which are growing for the for all their life. Yeah. They have very long reserve crowns, so they have a very a big reserve area. But as soon as that is gone, it's gone. That's also why there is a limitation in, in the life expectancy of horses. Yeah. It's mostly based on their teeth because as soon as they reach 25, 30, 35, they will lose their dentition and they will die. Same with the elephants. It's a very nice story, but it's, we won't have the time. But uh, elephants die because their last teeth are uh, wearing down when they are in between 40 and 50 years of age. And then they, they lose their dentition. They are such big animals. They cannot survive without teeth and they would just die. Yeah. Um, so it's really important. If you overfloat, uh, you will get into problems. Um, another thing is that Horses, they do have a, a very uh, dynamic system of protecting their own teeth because they have much wider uh, roots um, and the, the opening is much wider for sure in young horses. So they have good blood supply because if we have a dental problem, 
the typical clinical sign is that you get this pulsation in, mm -hmm. in your bone. And that's actually uh, caused by the fact that the blood vessel, which is entering the tooth, is getting uh, compressed due to it's only a small space and inflammation makes the tissues swelling. And so you get a strangulation of that nerve and blood vessels. That's why at first instance that you have this pulsating uh, heavy pain. Horses have much more possibilities to still have blood flow going to that tooth. So it means that in humans, if you have a tooth abscess, almost always your entire tooth is dead. In horses, if you have a tooth abscess, almost always that tooth is still partially alive, which is maybe a good thing, but it's also a danger because quite often they are in this, you know, like uh, in-between state. Yeah. Part of it is dead, part of that is alive, yeah. which then means they have a kind of ceasefire in best cases, but as soon as something happens, their immunity goes down for whatever reason, then the infection goes back into that that uh, still vital part of the tooth. So you can have these relapses and this fluctuation all, all over yeah. the time. That's which, also... Which you see signs then in behavior. Yes, in which can show... Yeah, 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 of course, they can have uh, changes in behavior. They can have changes in rideability. Um, yes, of course. And condition, because depending on how yeah, you come to that. Absolutely. All those things. So that's the, the, the tricky part for us. They cannot tell us where it's hurting. Uh, and the second thing is dental problems can have a tendency to, to, to go on for a very long time in horses um, before you, you really see it. That's why we need to do this full investigation. And then yeah. coming back to this, um, this uh, story, you know, like in, in the old days, the farrier would just come and uh, just do some floating on, the, on these teeth. The, the bottom line is you, ha yeah, you need to do an oral examination. Yeah. You cannot treat before you have done a diagnosis. Yeah. So the, the thing is good uh, examination, diagnosis, and then the question should be, what actually do we want to improve in this case? Yeah. And that makes a treatment plan. And then you have to evaluate afterwards whether that treatment was the good treatment or not. Yeah. That's why we document our cases, we make pictures. So we see this horse again after six months or one year, and then we see, okay, that tooth is still, you know, like a little bit out of the line, but it's already 50% better than last year. Yeah. That's a success. Yeah. We go on on the same treatment and we will in the end achieve or we see nothing has changed or we see in worst case uh, other things happening yeah. so um, yeah. yeah that's yeah. how we should approach dentistry yeah. in horses yeah. i guess yeah so <clears throat> going on then to we're talking about general well-being how much of course we we now i mean that's another topic we can go forever of how what are the effects and how many effects and of course you have yeah thousands of cases a year of what to talk about that but how much of the oral health then would influence um performance if we're talking about yeah um when and 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 sort of a double-edged sword how much of the uh, dental care creates uh, the performance and how much of kind of bad riding or training mm -hmm. affects yeah the health of the oral cavity yeah tricky question eh? because it's all so related and it's all yeah. so multifactorial so it means that you know the ideal horse with a very good mouth with a good training and a good rider doesn't need anything you know like probably don't need any dental care the reality is that most horses they have a suboptimal mouth mm -hmm. Partially also because of our breeding, we are changing horses yeah, yeah. to what we want them to be. And again, I'm not pointing at the dressage riders, but they're good examples because they want very tall horses. You want a fast growing horse, which end up around 175, 170. Um, and you actually want it to be really pretty as well. And what is pretty in, in our minds is to have a very pronounced forehead, yeah. big eyes, rather a small nose because it gives a lot of expression to that horse. Too low. Yeah. It it actually makes it more complex. Yeah. You know, if we would if we would allow our horses to have this old fashioned uh big heads, uh with a lot of space for the sinuses, um, not too thin skin, you know, like it would be easier. Yeah. But we are changing that. And it, it's for me it's okay, but we need to realize that it's yeah. the same with the Arabian horses, it's the same with the miniature horses. So if you ask me what's the with what kind of breed you have least problems, then I would say you just need a uh, interbred 
zebra size horse some pony in there some some tinker in there doesn't matter but just a good mixture and you will probably have the um, the best yeah. mouths statistically yeah. view uh, from a statistic point of view uh, the more you go to bigger horses or very small horses the more you will see the changes um well, i even see it now with <clears throat> my few years uh, being in horses the the difference between horses from 20 years ago with a double bridle into now yeah, absolutely how many more horses have a lot more trouble yeah. and yeah everybody i think rode in 20 years ago just about in a similar combination yeah. and now of course with innovation and everything comes with branding yeah. all that as well but the amount of horses that have problems yeah. with the connection with the bit um and yeah, and, that's... and exactly like you say the most of them are the the pretty ones with the fine head and yeah so we do make it ourselves rather complex by breeding these type of horses and um this now becomes very philosophical but uh, and i don't again i don't want to blame anyone but of course the money is in the the um, the horses which are going to a high level and so everyone is breeding these but it basically means we are overproducing this type of horses and in the end if they are not good enough, they end up with riders with less experience. Um, and then also a lot of our riders, they have less experience with horses from from start, uh, from their childhood, because they were living on a farm, for example. And so if you look at it, we kind of copy paste a lot of things we see from professional riders. And then I, I often argue, but why are you doing this? Because you just want to have a horse for a easy walk out in the fields why are you actually putting a high nose bend maybe that old-fashioned low one would be much more okay for your horse you know because it doesn't interfere with the um, um the enamel points yeah because the low nose bend is below the point where the cheek teeth are starting so you decrease the chances for creating um lesions in the mucosa due to compression by the nose bend yeah but we all tend to do the same and we want this high nose bend with this flesh and we want this double uh, or three piece snaffle yeah. just because out of the blue in the 90s someone started with it and now everyone does. So that's what's actually, actually also making it problematic is that we're doing a lot of difficult things uh, all together. So we increase the risks and then maybe it's a good good timing to start about these bitching lesions. Yeah. If, if you... If you look at it, so we're doing, we have a complex situation with a three-piece snaffle, with a high nose bend, with a with a, a horse's head, which is not the easiest one to actually fit a bridle and a, and a snaffle. And then we often, and again, I'm not pointing to the dressage riders, but as an example, it really works because what is a dressage rider doing on average? They're doing dressage. How often are they going out in the fields with their horses? Often not that much. How often do they jump with their horse? How often do they change the bridle? How often do they have another rider on top of their horse? It's very limited because they are often so afraid that if you change one thing, the whole thing will fall apart and nothing's going to work. But think about this. If you make a small mistake, it doesn't really matter. If I would give you a pair of shoes, which is half a size too wide, and I would just ask you for one hour, make a walk with it. And afterwards, I give you back your normal size shoe you won't have any problems but and for sure not if that's a running shoe you know like a a very easy going shoe but yeah. if i would give you high heels which are half a size too wide and i would ask you to walk with those for 18 hours a day the whole week then the chances are much higher you would end up in problems yeah. so thinking about for example a double bridle you should think about high heels who is capable of walking with high heels only females on average after good training on a good surface, they are not going to, to catch their horses in the field on high heels. Yeah. It's just not working. And you only do that for a limited amount of time, once a week, twice a week, doesn't really matter. So the frequency is massively important. Yeah. If you lower the frequency, you will see that you will create much less lesions. Yeah. Frequency is point 0.1. And then pressure or pressure is point 0.2. It doesn't matter if I would ask you to give you your arm and I would just start squeezing your arm with my index and my thumb. 
I can hurt you a tiny bit, but you won't start screaming. And if I do it for 10 seconds, I completely compress your blood vessels. There's no blood running anymore, but it doesn't matter because it's only 10 seconds. And as soon as I release, the blood starts to run again or circulate again. And there's, there's not an issue. And I can do that 50 times. Yeah. Um, and you won't have a bruise. You won't be painful. But if I don't um, uh, release the pressure after 10 seconds and I just keep on pushing, then I'm going to create hypoxia in the tissues and you will create damage. And if you do that, it takes much longer to heal. And so you actually create a pressure wound, a decubitus wound, as people have in hospital when they are uh, for months in a, in a bed. In bed yeah. And that doesn't heal at all. Um, so thinking about this, I don't care. Actually, I don't care how hard you pull the reins. As long as it's um, from a training point of view, it makes sense to give a, a information to the horse. It's not brutal. So you build up the pressure and it is dynamic. So as soon as the horse starts to react, the pressure starts to go down. It's not on or off. It's gradual. Mm -hmm. And if then you would um, tell me, uh, secretly, you know, I, I had 20 kilos of pressure. I would say it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter as long as it's not too long, not yeah. too often. So start counting. If you ask your horse something, it doesn't react. Just increase pressure and start counting to 10. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't work, increase pressure until you see or sense the first uh, change in that horse yeah. behavior. And then you need to reward that horse instantly and the yeah. pressure needs to come down. Yeah. I think that's really important. And if you do it in such a way, you'll have a hard time creating lesions. Yeah. It's an interesting point because a lot of horses that are in top sport uh, and also recreational are having, I think it's a human condition that we find something that works or we're afraid to change. Yeah. Horses, you know, for whatever reason, get into the double bridle, often not for a correct reason, but more a control yep. thing or... They're at that level, so that level says you're going to have double right yep, in there. And it's in forever. It's in, and then yep. it's in. Yep. And then it's never coming out again. Yep. And then the other thing is what people are actually wanting from the horse, what connection they're wanting, why they're wanting it. Yep. You know, a lot of riders like a hell of a lot of pressure yep. to hold a lot because of the control thing. Yep. Um, in a lot of cases, or well, from my experience, when I ask a student or a rider or I feel how the horse is, and then when you think about it, in that way, yeah, then you get a different perspective of, okay, what are we wanting? Yeah. And what effect does it really have uh, on the horse? Um, and then it sort of it sort of answers my next question because I was thinking we have, of course, in sport, a blood rule. It's there mm -hmm. for a reason. <clears throat> um, and a lot of the time, things can happen by mistake. The horse bites yep. the, the lip or he gets yep. in a focus or a concentration or a moment of stress. Yep. Like we've just talked about. How serious is it? I mean, you see a lot of um, horses and a lot mm -hmm. of in, the insides of horses' mouths from recreational and yep. a lot of top sport performance horses, of course. How much of a problem is that? Yeah. It's, it's a good question. So let's go back to what I spoke about if I would make a back to your arm actually so you give me back your arm and I have a very sharp knife and I just make a small incision in your arm it's gone there's gonna be blood for sure so if that would be a horse's tongue you will see it and that horse will be excluded from competition which is a good thing I think because if there is blood something go is going on but imagine then I would just wipe off the blood, disinfect it, put a small bandage, and I will see you back in one week. There's, there's no problem at all. That healed off really, really nice. Um, but then again, to this chronic pressure with a blunt um, um, thing, as for example, with a, with a snaffle or with a double bridle, there's no blood. I'm actually just squeezing the tissues. I'm, I'm, I'm getting rid of all the blood which is in there, causing hypoxia. So the cells are dying and you get this very chronic wound, which is actually not bleeding. Mm -hmm. If you want to, to describe it with colors, making that incision in your, in your arm, it's red. Yeah. It's nicely red. Creating that chronic bar lesion with a double bridle, it's purple to gray. And that's not bleeding. So I, I do think it's a good rule. But on the other hand, it's so limiting because it means that the worst 
cases, they are not bleeding yeah. uh, at all. And that's what I and think of immediately. I mean, nobody wants to see the blood or whatever. And of course, we have to have those rules in place and, and yeah. nobody wants to see it. And it's not nice for the horse. But actually, the worst things yeah. are the things we often yeah, of course. don't and, see. And so we are lacking a lot of knowledge. We're lacking a lot of uh, science. But if there is one thing which has been studied quite a lot in the last years, it's the prevalence of bitting injuries in different populations across the world. So it's, of course, different to look at dressage horses compared to race horses or whatever, but the results are quite similar and it's, it's pretty um, inconvenient through this, yeah. is that we are above 60% of horses which are um, ridden. It depends a little bit on what values they use, but let's say ridden more than three times a week um, and last time within the last three days, if you examine those horses, then you're above 60% of bitting injuries. Not all 60% of them are serious injuries. Some of them are really minor, but it's still, it's, it's huge. Yeah. And I think it's really important within the equestrian community that we are, we are open to this and we, we want to improve this and discuss this because there's other people around who are really criticizing the equestrian world for riding on horses and if then they would see this and they 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 and they are doing it they would just argue you know like 60 percent of these horses in their oral cavity they are injured so riding on horse should be forbidden yeah. and that's at stake you know like 10 years ago or 20 years ago i would have laughed with this kind of discussion um because i thought it was completely unrealistic that we would come to this point but actually we are. And I, I really think it's a, a matter of animal welfare and we should yeah. pay attention yeah. to it because it's not so difficult to get rid of at least 30 or 40 percent of these bitting injuries mm -hmm. just by correctly checking the oral cavity, adjusting the bit and training the riders. Just changing the nose bend now and then, just changing the bridle, just having, um, don't mask everything because what, again, I'm talking mostly on dressage now, but what most of them are doing is close them out with the nose bent, uh, keep everything very tight, and basically you don't see what's what's going on. Yeah. So I would and invite. Of course, it's done in order to make sure that you are getting the points in the ring, because of course that's the requirement. Yeah. If yeah. The, if the mouth Absolutely. is slightly open. Yeah. And that's that's also one point we need to educate the judges as well, because the mouth. Of course, if the, 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 the mouth is open, you know, like very wide for a long time, then it's a sign of uh, resistance of that horse or uncomfortable, um, that it's uncomfortable. But I don't agree that the mouth should be completely closed because that's another thing. If, if I... Your first point of the chewing and... The absolutely. Release. They need to be able to, to play around with that masseter muscle. That's the first thing. And the second thing is there is no species whatsoever which is finding it uh, beneficial to close their mouth. And then I mean having contact on all teeth yeah. if they are in rest. You will not do that except if you are very stressed. So again, if I would tell you I'm going to shoot someone in the audience, then you will start yeah. having occlusion on your teeth. Mm -hmm. But if not, you won't. You always have a little bit of space in between because for the tissues, it takes energy um, to to kind of uh, counteracts the effect of pressure. Yeah. Um, so you need to uh, have blood supply and whatever. So horses, they don't do it. So why are we tightening that nose bend so hard? Yeah. Um, we should allow them to open, you know, like half centimeter, yeah. a centimeter yeah. easily. Yeah. Um, that's really important. But what I would advise to all riders is, because you mentioned, yeah, the judges, they want to see it. Yeah, it's true. But the judges, they're only there on Sunday, you know. Yeah. Um, so in your training, be brave enough to do the same exercises without your nose bent yeah. and see what happens and ask a good friend or your trainer to make some pictures. Yeah. It, it's, sometimes it's very shocking, but it can learn you so much because if you do a very easy exercise, you just uh, go from walk to, yeah. uh, to, to trot and back. Yeah. And if then that horse without a nose bent is opening its mouth and you mm -hmm. see a purple tongue coming out, then you know something's terribly wrong. Yeah. And if you close everything with the nose bent, you won't see it until the problems are really big. Yeah. So uh, we often do that. If we do any bitting advice, most of the times I have my rider sitting on that horse, everything as usual, except for the nose bent, it's yeah. completely loose and then let them 
do the thing and it's it's shocking what comes out of that and it's an important thing because it, it, there's a big stigma because of sport and because there's a risk that the horse could learn something or start to open the mouth or you know stick mm -hmm. the tongue out and i think and that is the difficulty i have if i have horses with tension issues uh, often caused by these uh, patterns it's it's then when you say oh we just take the nose bend off it's like oh like Oh, you could be opening a can of worms, yeah. and, and and I can't have that uh, yeah. for the ring. And for me, that's the process of finding out mm -hmm. what he knows, teach him to pick up the bit instead of getting yeah. him to to take it. I think the other interesting point is the open mouth thing, because of course education is a, is the solution for everything, and and I think it's difficult for people to recognize with an open mouth what kind of open mouth it is yeah you know especially in a sport where you only see them for a few minutes in the passing and yeah and judges from different angles yeah talking about dressers again <clears throat> but i i think it's also interesting that i mean we can go into many comparisons also with um different horses with different sports and like you say changing jumpers change the bits a lot yeah, yeah. um <clears throat> but also that thing of um it's sort of i always when i viewed and it's shocking when people see the blood thing um, and it's not something you want to see, but I had somewhere the feeling in me that, yeah, that's not that bad mm -hmm. compared to someone. And we have a lot of yeah. holding, absolutely riding with, you know, not being when you, you, you see the combinations that the, the goal in the training is to get him into a position where yeah. I have something to hold on to. Yeah. And, you know, you can just see if you, it's a holding riding. And if you give on the rain, then yeah. everything falls apart. Yeah, and it, it's. And that feeling is giving the impression of the constant pressure. Yeah. And and my feeling is that, of course, as you just said, that that would be a much worse case than a, a, a Biden. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so the, the, the momentary pressure, is. it's of no, except for, you know, like they're really pulling on the reins, mm -hmm. but otherwise it's of non-importance. Mm -hmm. So every chronic pressure and every device which enables you to keep that chronic pressure, like draw reins, mm -hmm is dangerous i'm not saying they don't have any function but you need to be really careful because yeah. if you use them in a chronic way it's always wrong but then we come and maybe that's a again a very philosophic uh thing but then we come to the point what what do we need to change because you the judges it's difficult for them as well and the other thing is that it does work to abuse a horse because mm. it's it's the fastest way to learn them something it, it's I'm, I'm not happy saying this but it's a reality you take a very young horse we all know it's easier to break a two-year-old compared to a four-year-old because that four-year-old is stronger so if it's about if pressure it's if it's between yeah. Yeah. yeah so so it it is a fast way and i think what should be changed is that we slow down a little bit if we would accept that horses need more time before they go to a certain point um, or before they are allowed to do a certain level, then the the playing field is more equal for those trainers who want to do it in a good way yeah. because they are in the disadvantage because their approach on average, I know you're massively talented and you probably can have the same speed, but most of us, they don't. So it's easier to yeah. to squeeze them into the shape you want yeah. than to communicate with the horse and train it in a decent way and come to the same level. So I would say competitions should start a bit later. And on the other hand, I would say horses competing on the highest level when they are older, they should get better points because that, that actually triggers trainers to keep their horses in good shape and good health. Yeah. The truth is that, of course, there's a lot of money involved in trading horses as yeah. well. So is it such a big problem for a horse trader if that horse is completely broken uh, after yeah. four years? Yeah. No, because it has done the, the thing. It, it, it went to the highest possible level and then that, that rider is going to buy another horse. So yeah. it, it keeps the, the wheel turning. Um, so that's a big discussion, yeah. you know. Um, Difficult factors yeah, in that, and yeah. timing is all. But I still like believe that. that most riders they want to have good connection with their horse. So, so and and then again we come back to the first point: try to be early with your adjustments because if you learn these horses this behavior, uh, a lot of horses they are seeking the pressure actually by themselves, yeah, yeah. and that's just learned helplessness. 
they are not born like this, but at some point they gave up or they were squeezed. And I think that's really hard to get yeah. to, 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 to relearn these horses. Yeah. Takes a lot of time and a lot yeah. of talent, I think. Yeah. So focus so, on the young ones and yeah. Yeah, focus on small, small signs yeah. uh, you can, uh, or observations. And do you see then when we're talking about the lesions um, <clears throat> and injuries, do you see as many bridal injuries as uh, bit injuries? Because of, uh, I think when people think of um, checking in the mouth, yep. checking for lesions, they're, we're always thinking about only bit. Yeah. No, no, we do see... Is it cutting is the bit too wide and then, yep. of course, the double jointed is sitting. Yeah. Yeah. Is it bridles as well? Bridles as well, um, probably to a less extent, but but for sure it, it's very common to have mm -hmm. lesions at the level of the of the nose band. Uh, it's very common. Um, also, looking at the, the entire horse's head, we do see depression on the on the nose mm -hmm. quite a lot. We do see the white hairs behind their ears mm -hmm. quite often, um, and that as well. You know, like in the old days, we didn't have these anatomical bridles. Nowadays, quite often we need them. And again, it's because we changed the horse's head, we changed the way we ride, we changed the, um, the, 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 the snaffle or the double bridle, yeah. which all makes it much more prone to damage. So, yeah. Um, yeah. 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 What's your nose band rule then? Um, yeah, it's a good, good question as well, because uh, I know there's a lot of debate about it. Um, an interesting thing is that there has been a lot of studies on the prevalence of bitting injuries. And uh, of course, because it's such a high prevalence, there's a lot of people uh, advocating that we should not use a bit, we should not use a nose bend or whatever. So or even these studies have been done. So riding without a snaffle, uh, bitless riding, doesn't mean that there are no injuries in the oral cavity. You see an increase in nose bend lesions. Logic, actually, because if you if you just change where the pressure is, then probably the lesions will change to where that uh, amount of pressure goes. Um, but interestingly, um, if you ask, for example, your dressage riders to ride without a nose bend, you see more lesions as well. Um, For the instability of the bridle? Yes, or, yeah. so there is instability. Yes. And just having somewhere a limitation on, on how far it can open the mouth seems to be in the advantage for the horse. So I would say it, the horse should be perfectly okay to open its mouth for about two centimeters mm -hmm. without creating massive pressure. If at that moment the pressure starts, then I think the horse has the choice to open or close its mouth more or less. Um, and normally, because then people often think, but then the horse is going to pop out his tongue. If the tongue comes out, you know, like for five centimeters or it's hanging to one side, it's always something's wrong because that horse is not doing that for fun. Um, on the other hand, if just a small part of the tip of the tongue is visible, then I don't think it's a problem. And that's something we need to learn our judges. I have a four-year-old daughter at home. When she is making a drawing, she always shows the point of her tongue because of concentration. Yeah. She's not having a, any kind of beating injuries. Um, so I, I think that's a different thing yeah. as well. Yeah. And that's it's all about reading the mental state of these horses. It's mm -hmm. where this pain phase comes in. It's where the position of their ears, whether they have their, their ears, you know, like playing around or in a fixed position for a extended period of time. I think we need to focus on that and the judges should be aware of that as well. So there, there is still quite some work to do, I guess. Yeah, so that was my question then. The next one, bit or no bit. Yeah. But that's... I would say it's a, it, 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 it doesn't make sense to have this discussion, but I would probably vote rather with yeah. an adjusted bit um, or the combination again, you know, yeah. like it would be super cool if you are going on Grand Prix level with the double bridle and the day afterwards your horse has been, uh, uh, it, it just needs some, um, some warming up and you yeah. go out in the fields without a bit. Yes. I think that that would yeah. be ideal if you just change. Interesting thing as well. So if you look at bitting injuries, when do you see them the most? It's when you have a single horse rider um, combination. Mm -hmm. So often people think that if you go to a riding school, these horses, they will have the worst oral cavities. To be honest, it's not because there is a huge variety. You have first day there's um, person A riding on that horse, more pulling to the right. Second day there's someone else more pulling to the left. First day, it was the, 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 the right uh, bridle they put on. The second day, they, they mistaken Blackie with Beauty and they put on the wrong bridle. 
but you see there is a lot of things going on there and they most often their training is not on a very high level uh so so if you keep the same bridle the same rider the same training the same horse everything fix that increases your risks yeah. dramatically yeah so yeah and i suppose it's like the eight old case i mean the, the the perfect bit and the perfect bridle in the wrong hands still problematic and cause damage yeah. also a bitless bridle in the wrong hands wrong end Absolutely. Of the head, people used to say me oh, you should not use a whip with the horse and it's i not... put the whip on the ground and i say well is it doing harm yeah or yeah <laughs> What, it's it's the same discussion, a whip or not. If you use it to to really create pain in the horse, then of course it's uh, it's abuse. Yeah. But just having it or to just point out something to the horse, then there is no problem. So I don't see any problem in a bit. I don't see any problem in a whip. It's it's how you use them, yes. which is most important, Absolutely. of course. So innovation. Mm -hmm. What are the next steps? Um, ensuring comfort for our horsemen bridling and bidding where is it going now are we looking at personalized 3d printed bits yeah for each individual horse or where, because of course the evolution unless we decide very intelligently that what we're breeding is going to make everything more difficult and we need to maybe start to think about that in the breeding and yeah. and, and get the structure of the head to start to come yeah. back to a normal state or you know, like it's the same as with the, the climate issues. Uh, nowadays, uh, people would say we, we will just invest in, in captation of CO2. Yeah, mm -hmm. It's the same with the 3D printed bits. Yeah. It might help. It might help in some cases, but it's on the very end of the circle. You should yeah. go back to the start and see where is the problem coming from. Yes. The problem is coming from lack of education. That's mm -hmm. the biggest thing. Because um, even, you know, how we change the horses... I think, I do believe we're coming to the limit of what we are doing. Yeah. Um, if, I, if I'm right, I think we're coming back a little bit now from these very big horses with yeah. this very massive movement because we see that actually most of them, they, they are not capable of keeping up with this work. So my hope is that we come down a little bit again yeah. to a little bit more versatile horse. Mm -hmm. And then I think we need training. We need, for sure, we need research. Research on uh, pain signs of horses. Yeah. Uh, and I think we need changes in the, in the regulations as we, we've been talking about uh, at what age they are, they are um, uh, able to compete and till what age and how do they get their points. Um, I think that's the biggest win we can make. Um, there's definitely going to be some, some more evolution for sure when it comes to, the, to my um, field of expertise, to the dental treatments. Mm -hmm. We do see that if we treat, for example, uh, a, a chronic tooth abscess, then we do see changes in that horse's behavior. So I do think we will uh, get better and better at that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's only one piece of, the, of that big puzzle, and that's the, that's the big challenge. It's yeah. a big puzzle, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well... Mate, I, uh, my brain is going now 100 miles an hour and we could now speak yeah. for another for two days, five hours. And I, if you will, I would love to have you back at some stage because, I mean, there's so much stuff to cover here and I think it's just so important. Like you say, we're very fast to make new innovation and to try to make the newest and the best thing. Mm -hmm. But as you say, going back, having yeah. more education, looking and seeing, I've learned already a whole heap just in our discussion today. So thank you for being here. Pleasure Everyone can, of course, you have an amazing website, actually, and I also during my research, all your YouTube videos, which, okay, we've known each other for quite some time now, and I, yeah. Th yeah. there's some great stuff also there. So make sure, guys, you check out uh, Walter on all the social media channels. And uh, yeah. Yeah, we'll be happy to, to do another uh, episode at some yeah. point or small webinar or whatever um so yeah it was pleasure was mine it's uh, always interesting to uh see the bigger picture so yeah cheers thanks very much you're welcome so guys you know the drill if you like this podcast share it with anybody and anyone who is into horses i don't have to tell you that because i'm sure you'll share this one if you're as excited as i am be good to your horses and we'll see you again next time